So Jesus' words for us today are especially timely. As we continue our walk through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is today talking about anxiety and worry. You know, this is a difficult moment in history for all of us. But we need to recognize that this is especially difficult for those of us who are always anxious. Uh, those who struggle with anxiety will, will tell you that, that there's this like little engine inside of them that is fueled and fed by worry. And in moments of significant crisis, like the one that our world is in right now, that little engine is being constantly fueled and affirmed. With every headline that we read, every post on Facebook that we see, that little engine of anxiety is, is being given fuel for the fire and affirmation. It's being told, you have reason to worry and you are right. You are so right to worry. Which can make this moment especially crippling and consuming and confusing for those who struggle with anxiety. And if that's true for you, then, then my, my prayer for you is that as we listen to the words of Jesus this morning, that three things would become abundantly clear for you. Number one, that God sees you. Number two, that he loves you. And number three, that he is taking care of you. So let's dive in. Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 25, Jesus says this, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. So Jesus gives us three categories for our worries. Food, body, and clothing. It's another way of saying the essentials. Now, there's a reason that Jesus doesn't talk about the big fears, like pandemics, or climate change, or the next world war. It's not that those things can't happen. Uh, obviously, they can. It's not that they're unimportant if they do happen. Of course, they are. But Jesus' point is this, that all anxiety, even anxiety about the coronavirus, comes down to, con to a concern about one's own personal well-being. What makes someone anxious in a moment like this is, is that there, th there seems to be this, this threatening and frightening thing out there that is threatening my little world that I want to have control of right here. In the ancient world, and actually for, for most of human history, the world out there was always a frightening and terrifying place. It was a world where wars and plagues and unstable governments abounded, and, and the world itself was very chaotic and, and a very scary place. It really wasn't until the Enlightenment, around about the 18th century or so, that there was enough shifting in thinking and advancements in society that, that our understanding of the world as a risky, uncertain, and unsafe place started to change. We made enough advancements that we could kind of keep that world at bay. The world seemed to calm down. It seemed to. Uh, Herbert Butterfield was a famous historian at Cambridge University. And in the 1940s, as the world was coming to terms with World War II, he, he wrote about the difference in, in the experience between ancient people and modern people. This is what he writes. He says, Men today may live to a great age in days of comparative quietness and peaceful progress without ever having to come to grips with the universe. We, meaning modern people, have been particularly spoiled the Old Testament people, the ancient Greeks, and all of our ancestors down to the 17th century betray or show in their philosophy and their outlook a terrible awareness of the chanciness of human life and the precarious nature of man's existence in this risky universe. His point was this, that for much of human history, the chaos of life was, was a constant threat to everyday life. And it forced people in the past with regularity to worry about their well-being and to, to recognize how small they were and how little control we have in the world. But modern people, us, you and me, we have become largely insulated and protected from the reality of, of a very scary world, which means on the rare occasions that the chaotic and unpredictable world breaks through our modern barriers, we as modern people are all of a sudden spiritually and emotionally and personally surprised and unprepared 
But know this, this is nothing new. The world has always been a frightening and scary and unpredictable place. The truth is that you are not alone. You are not the first nor the last to experience this. You're not alone. And into that reality of the world being a scary and unpredictable place that threatens our personal well-being and our own little planet that we try to control comes Jesus with these words of wisdom and comfort. And he says, do not worry about your own well-being. Don't. Now, by itself, that statement is not very helpful nor comforting. Thankfully, Jesus has more to say. In fact, as you continue to read through Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 25, Jesus gives us three reasons why we need not be anxious about our own well-being. And these three reasons are are worth jotting down. Uh, Let's start at the second half of verse 25. The first thing Jesus says is this, Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? So Jesus' first point is this. You should not and need not be anxious about your own well-being because it serves as a distraction from the things that matter the most. It, It keeps you from attending to the truly important things, the things that you love and actually long to be focused on. Here's a truth that I that I want you to grasp, especially if you struggle with anxiety. What you focus on determines what you miss. What you focus on determines what you miss. What you choose to fix your eyes on not only determines what you see, but it also sets a boundary line and determines all the things you won't see, that you won't appreciate, and you won't enjoy. You see, what happens when when anxiety wells up in us as human beings is that we tend to make small things too big and big things too small. And the reason we do that is because it gives us this false sense of security and sense of control. We make small things too big and big things too small. For for, for example, we hoard supplies from the store when the supply chain has not been threatened. We make a small thing a big thing in order to retain control. We keep our eyes locked on the news every second of every day, even though we know the news hasn't really changed today. And we make a small thing a big thing in order to retain control. Small thing, big thing. Um, The big things are being present with the people that you love. The big things are uh, enjoying the life around you that God has given to you. The big things are praying to the God above you who's actually in control of all things. You see, here's the, the, the wicked irony of anxiety. When anxiety wells up, you, you try to lay, lay your hands upon everything in your life in order to protect and keep the things that you love. But in an effort to protect and keep the things that you love, you get distracted and you fail to see and enjoy the very things you're trying to protect. And so Jesus says, is not life more than food and clothing? What you focus on determines what you miss. So Jesus says, you need not worry because when you choose to worry, you will miss out on what matters most. Jesus continues, starting at verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So so God, by definition, is in control over all things. He commands the complexity of the universe all the way down to the birds in the air, the flowers of the field, and the grass on your lawn. All of it is dependent upon him. And yet scripture tells us that it's, it's you and me, it's humanity that is the crown of his creation. It's the thing that he celebrates the most and values the most. It's the thing that he considers to be his masterpiece, you and me, all of humanity. Uh, we are to God's creation what, um, uh, what the Sistine Chapel is to Michelangelo, 
what Hey Jude is to the Beatles, what the Honey Butter Chicken Biscuit is to Whataburger. We are the best thing he's ever done. And that's God's opinion, not mine. So if God provides for and is attentive to the lesser parts of creation, don't you think that he's also going to be attentive to and provide for you who he considers to be the crown of creation? That's Jesus's point. The generosity of God extends to everything. And you, you are not just anything. You're the crown of his creation. And that's really the second point that Jesus gives us. So the first point is that worry distracts you from what you're trying to protect. And the second point is that God promises to be generous to you and good to you, to continue his generosity toward you. You see, what your anxiety will try to tell you is that you are the exception to that rule. Your anxiety will try to tell you that you are the one person that God won't provide for, just like he provides for the flowers of the field. Your anxiety will try to remind you of all the stupid and horrible things you've done that should technically exempt you from God's love, like how crazy you were in college and then in your 20s, or how disobedient you were last week to the things you know you should have done, or how much doubt and unbelief flows through you on on an everyday basis. Your anxiety will remind you of those things and say, well, maybe that, maybe that makes you the exception to God's rule of being good and generous to the crown of his creation. But one phrase that Jesus said is so important. One phrase is so important. Jesus says, will he not much more clothe you, listen in, O you of little faith. Jesus recognizes the fact that among the people in the crowd, which includes the crowd gathered around his word online this morning, in that crowd are people who have very little, if any, faith. Listening to Jesus' words are faithless people. And Jesus says that to the faithless people, the struggling people, the people who make mistakes, the people whose hearts are overwhelmed with worry, God's grace and his goodness and his generosity even extends to them. It extends all the way to you and extends all the way to me. You still qualify. You still qualify. I need you to hear that. You still qualify for the generosity and the goodness of God. And when Jesus says these words, he is speaking to that little engine of anxiety inside of your heart. He's saying God's extravagance is not dependent upon your obedience. God does not grade on a curve. You overestimate your impact. He does not hand out performance pay. He just provides. He just provides. Each and every day, he is showering you in millions upon millions of blessings, most of which you never notice, some of which you see. And he gives you those blessings whether you recognize him or not, believe in him or not, whether or not you've offended him or done something wrong in his eyes. He gives these blessings by virtue of the fact that there is ground underneath your feet and breath in your lungs and and a sun shining in the sky above you and coffee in your cup. It means that the God of the universe is actively blessing and caring for you right now. Right now, and if he is willing and able to care for you relentlessly in the little things today, why wouldn't he? Why wouldn't he care for you and carry you through this big, scary thing? That's Jesus' point. He continues, picking up now in verse 31. He says, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all those things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. So so Gentiles is a blanket term for people who are outside of the family of faith and who typically took part in what we call pagan spirituality. Now, in first century pagan spirituality, there was a a whole host of gods, each of which was kind of assigned to a different personal everyday need that people were constantly trying to please based on what they perceived their biggest need to be. 
And so you'd spend a ton of time in the temple or making sacrifices to a particular God, trying to get them to pay attention to some need in your life. You ended up in pagan spirituality, spending a ton of emotional energy and personal resources just trying to get the the God of a good crop to pay attention to you. I remember going grocery shopping with my mom when I was like six years old. And my mom would uh, grab the cart, she'd start going shopping for groceries, and I would immediately head off to the toy aisle. And I'd go grab some action figure, and I'd run back to the cart, and I would stand in front of the cart, walking backwards while my mom's trying to grocery shop, showing her the toy and trying to convince her that I needed it. Convince her that I wanted it, convince her that I would be such a good kid if she would just let me put this in the cart. Mom, can I put He-Man in the cart? Can I put the toy in the cart? In pagan spirituality, and and yet still today, in much of our understanding of spirituality, we believe that God works the same way. Even among really mature Christians, we, we get caught in this thinking that says, look, I know that God is in control of all things, and God is good, but when I get anxious, I start to wonder if he's going to be good in the way in which I want him or need him to be good. He might not get it right, so I need to compensate in some way, shape, or form. And so we find ourselves saying to God, God, um, I need some money right now. Could you put some money in the cart? Please, please, please put some money in the cart. I'll be a really good boy. Or I'm lonely and looking for love, and it's late in life, and I don't want to spend my later years alone. Please, please, could you just send somebody my way? Put someone handsome and successful and wealthy in the cart for me, please. And we think that we have to cajole and convince God to be good to us. And Jesus says, no, that is not how it works. You do not have one of the pagan gods who has to be convinced. What does he say? He says, you have a father. And there's a profound difference. You have a good father who knows your need and has a plan to provide for it. And that's the third thing to hold tight to. He knows your need and has a plan to provide for it. When I was five years old, my mom helped me write a letter to Mr. Rogers. That's why I'm wearing the cardigan today. She helped me write a letter to Mr. Rogers, and Mr. Rogers wrote me back. He wrote me back in his own hand and he answered all of my questions and even wrote out my name and spelled it correctly on the letter. Uh, I would show it to you, but my mom actually (laughs) threw it away, uh, which is why we don't speak anymore. I'm just kidding. Today's actually my mom's birthday. Happy birthday, mom. I love you, even though you threw that letter away. But here's the point. When I was five years old, I was overwhelmed at the idea that Mr. Rogers knew my name. He'd read it and he'd written it Mr. Rogers was my neighbor who knew my name. Now now think of this. The God of the universe, he knows your name. He knows your name, and even better than that, he says, I am your father, which means he knows every single one of your needs, and he has a plan to provide for it. Let that give you peace. Now, I'll I'll be honest with you. you. You might not yet find everything I've said to be all that helpful. And I don't blame you. Uh, Letting go of anxiety is is easier said than done. And people don't stop worrying just because somebody says to them, hey, don't worry, even if that somebody is Jesus. Earlier this week, I was having a conversation with my sister-in-law, who is very open about her struggles with anxiety. And this pandemic has been, I think, difficult for her, to say the least. And uh, I asked her, I said, what is the worst thing that someone who doesn't struggle with anxiety can say to you who does struggle with anxiety? And without missing a beat, she said to me, get over it. When someone says to me, get over it, that's the worst possible thing. I can't just stop being anxious. But then she said this, what actually does help though is when someone will listen to me. They'll listen to me and then they'll, they'll, They'll point me to something good, something that's good that I can be happy about that that kind of steals my focus for the moment. And, And there is a ton of truth in her words. The only thing that seems to lessen our anxiety, even if it's just for a moment, is when something more beautiful and wonderful kind of steals our gaze and captures our attention. Now, knowing that, listen to what Jesus does next in his teaching. He says this. 
He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Seek first the kingdom of God. Uh, the kingdom of God and his righteousness is, is kind of a, a flowery biblical way of, of talking about the saving, loving, and rescuing activity of God. So what Jesus is saying when he says seek first, he's saying shift your focus to the saving and loving activity of God the Father through me. You're going to focus on something in times of anxiety and worry. Shift your focus to the work that God is doing in the world for you through me. And of course, what is it that we see Jesus doing in the world? Well, you could say it like this, that Jesus came into the world to crush all of the things that leave you and me feeling anxious and powerless. Think about it for a second. You worry about whether or not you're a good enough person. Jesus was perfect. You worry about being rejected by others. Jesus was rejected by his closest friends and family. You worry about not having the necessities. Jesus was homeless. Did you know that? You worry about the chaos of this world overtaking your existence. The chaos of this world killed Jesus. Jesus came into our broken world and he let all the things that overwhelm us overwhelm him even to the point of death. And then he rose from it. He, he was victorious over it. He showed that it is no match for his power. And then he says, those of you who have faith in me, my victory over all the chaos and craziness of this world is your victory. Jesus says, I have come into this world that, that those who believe in me, they will not be overcome by the chaos of this world because I have overcome the world. You do not have to worry whether or not the craziness of this world will get the best of you because I have secured a place in God's family for you. I have overcome all that is chaotic. And if you belong to me, you will be okay. And so Jesus says, if you're going to focus on anything, if you're going to latch on to anything and obsess over anything in your anxiety, latch on to that. Focus on that. Bring that truth so close to your face that it's like the only thing that you can see and it makes everything else seem small and insignificant. This is why it's important for the rhythm of worship to be maintained because we bring the victory of Jesus close to our eyes and it and it casts away everything else that's causing anxiety. This is why it's important for us to, to be reading the scriptures, to, to find one little nugget of scriptural truth that gives you a particular feeling of peace and to focus on it and to meditate on it and to chew on it until the point where, as Luther says, you feel the divine presence. Uh, the verse that does that for me is Exodus 14, 14. It says, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. That is, the, that is the word that I meditate on and chew on in moments of anxiety. Look, I, I would never, ever tell you to just stop being anxious. That's not possible. What I would tell you is this, to shift the focus of your anxiety to the finished work of Jesus Christ. Hold on to that and let that drown out every other thing. Martin Luther, uh, the father of the Reformation, he had a good friend and a colleague named uh, Philip Melanchthon. And um, Melanchthon was a very key player in the Reformation. And in many ways, there are people who say that, that he was much smarter than Luther. He was a brilliant man, an incredible writer. He penned some of the most important documents of the Reformation. But Melanchthon was also a, uh, an infamous worrier. When, when the Reformation got dangerous, he would get overwhelmed. It was as if Langton thought that, that the well-being of Luther and the movement of the Reformation all depended on him. And in those moments where Melanchthon would get overwhelmed, Luther would very famously go to his colleague and friend and he would say these words. He would say, let Philip cease to rule the world. Let Philip cease to rule the world. It was Luther's way of reminding his friend that anxiety is asking for a job that is not yours. Anxiety is, is inviting yourself into a chair, into a table that, that only belongs to God and only does yourself harm. 
It is God's job to rule the world and fix all things and care for all things and protect all things. That is not your job. I know that this is a very difficult season for so many, but in particular for those who, who already wrestled with anxiety and worry. And if that's you, I want you to, to hear these words with the love and pastoral concern with which they are intended. Let yourself cease to rule the world. Let yourself cease to rule the world. You belong to God who's promised his generosity and his goodness to you, who has sent his son to defeat all, all of the things that your mind can imagine and that the world puts in front of you. You belong to a God who's promised to take care of you. Let yourself cease to rule the world. Focus instead on the work that God has done for you in Jesus Christ. Do not let do not let your worry distract you from the things that truly matter to you, that are probably right now sitting right next to you. Amen.